The story of Noah's Ark single-handedly destroys the credibility of the entire Bible, and I'm gonna show you how. Realizing that Noah's Ark didn't literally happen is something that I figured out entirely too late in life. And it's because, like many of you, I was raised in the church. And from the time I was in preschool, biblical literalism was hammered into me. I remember seeing these idyllic images of animals neatly lining up to board a wooden boat. From Sunday school stories to my first children's picture Bible, this tale was ingrained in me like it was fact. Now, I just covered in part one the various lines of evidence that proved that there was no global flood, but in in this video, I'm going to show you why the story of Noah's Ark itself, as told in Genesis, is absolutely impossible. Let's dive in, shall we? First off, if you've ever had an aquarium, you know that marine ecosystems are fragile. You change the temperature, pH, or salt levels even just a little bit, and everything starts sleeping with the fishes. Including the fishes. Salinity shock from a worldwide mega monsoon would nuke marine life. You mix 40 days of freshwater rain with salty seas and you get a brackish soup, lethal to most fish and marine invertebrates. But what about whales? They breathe air. Sure, but their kidneys can't filter chaos. Oh, and what about plants? It's not like most of them can survive underwater. The Bible says that God called all of the animals on earth to Noah's boat, but did millions of plant species come hauling ass as well? And he would need a a lot of plants too, because a single elephant eats 200 to 600 pounds of food a day. And remember, the Bible doesn't have them on a boat for just 40 days. That's just how long it supposedly rained for. Genesis says that this cruise lasted over a year. With just two elephants on an ark, you would need a minimum of 148,000 pounds of food just for those two animals, which they would somehow need to preserve without electricity or refrigeration. That's just one elephant species. Scientists have formally classified 2.2 million species, by the way, which is a tiny fraction of all of the animals that have existed. But let's say for sake of argument that they just had 10,000 species on the boat and God somehow rapidly diversified these species post flood. Does the, I believe in microevolution but not macroevolution crowd really wanna argue that evolution post flood took place at a rate thousands of times faster than anything we've ever observed? And what about animals that can literally only eat other animals? You know, whose digestive tracts can't handle plants? Would every dinner be a mass extinction event when you only have two of every animal on board? And just how many insects were on board the ark? Because pangolins consume over 100,000 insects a day each. Little brown bats eat 1,000 insects an hour. Oh, and somehow they fit all of these animals plus the millions of tons of food and water that it would take to keep them alive for a year all on a boat the size of a football field? And what about the poop? Our elephants over here produce 100 to 300 pounds of waste daily. Even if you just had 20,000 animals on the boat, you're looking at thousands of pounds of poo a day to shovel out the one single window on the ark. That is one big pile of shit. Oh, and while most Christians, rightfully embarrassed, are trying to talk down the claims of Noah's Ark to make it sound more believable, you've got answers in Genesis putting dinosaurs on board. It's therefore logical to conclude dinosaurs were part of the cargo carried on board. You actually believe that? And somehow we're meant to believe that a tiny family of eight centigenarians cared for this planet backup mega zoo stuffed with animals with extremely diverse needs for over a year without modern technology or veterinary medicine. And they did all of that while practically swimming in rotting food and fecal matter soup and with zero ventilation. Try this, take a heavy blanket, send underneath it, seal the bottom so that you have no outside air and see how long you can stay under it breathing your own recycled CO2. Now fart. Now do that for a year with tens of thousands of cramped animals breathing out carbon dioxide, farting out methane, pooping everywhere and peeing fresh hot ammonia all over the place. And remember, you have one door, one window, and they're both sealed shut. It's not a question of if you would asphyxiate, but a matter of how many minutes you would last. Vote again. Personally, I'd rather try my luck in the water. And how come no one's talking about the fact that they would have no light on board? It's not like they could have lit a candle because that would have been the world's biggest fire fart explosion. 
Imagine for a second, you're stuck in a pitch black boat with shrieking wailing animals, mountains of carcasses, rotting flesh, molding food, and sewage up to your waist, while wild, ravenous, hungry predators hunt in the darkness, tearing animals to shreds for a year. Yeah, reality would be far from the idyllic version picture story Bibles you always see. Oh, and somehow we're told that Noah's building this giant boat for years, warning everyone for years, and they don't listen to him at all understandably, but when you start having every single animal on earth miraculously showing up and you have orderly lines of tigers and penguins miraculously boarding this boat, we're meant to believe that not a single person looked at that and thought, oh crap, I better get on that boat. But speaking of, how did all of the animals get to that boat? Did the duck-billed platypus waddle all the way from Australia to an ark in the Middle East? Then he waddled away. Did the koala crawl all the way back there post-flood apocalypse without a shred of eucalyptus to eat along the way? What did any animal eat after the flood wiped out every plant on earth? Soil microbiomes would have been utterly destroyed, the dirt would be salty, not a single plant would be able to grow, and before you say that God just miraculously made all of the life come back, well then what was the point of needing to put all the animals on the boat in the first place? And most of these animals can't eat just anything. They occupy very niche and fragile ecosystems. For example, the Red Admiral Butterfly in New Zealand will only lay eggs on the Urtica ferox nettle plant found also exclusively in New Zealand. When its caterpillar eggs hatch, they will only eat that specific plant. The life cycle of this butterfly is about eight weeks. That means seven generations of butterflies would need enough of this very specific nettle on the ark in order to survive. And that is just one example among thousands of such plants and animals, which occupy extremely sensitive ecosystems. Oh, and once the rain started actually dropping, in order to cover the tops of Mount Everest with just 40 days of rainfall, you would generate enough heat from impact energy alone to boil the oceans and sterilize the planet's surface. The boat would have cooked. Hold up. Let him cook. And the atmospheric pressure changes alone from that much water vapor would be lethal to most life forms. Except maybe the tardigrade. Oh, and somehow they expect us to believe that all of the cold-blooded and hot-blooded animals survived together on the same non-climate controlled boat? So we've got a desert iguana and an emperor penguin surviving for a year at the same temperature? Tell me you don't know anything about biology. Oh, and what about the boat itself? Wooden ships have structural limits. We've built wooden vessels much smaller than the ark as described in Genesis, and they were already pushing the limits of wood and suffered from hogging and sagging that made them unseaworthy. And that was with modern technology and expert shipbuilders. And that's before you load them up with tens of thousands of tons of food, water, and animals. When Dutch creationist Johan Hybers created a slightly scaled down Noah's Ark replica, he had to reinforce it with a steel frame rested on a base of 21 steel lash barges just to keep it afloat in calm inland waters. And learned the hard way after spending millions of dollars that it would never be seaworthy. And y'all remember that this giant boat was allegedly built by a single 500 year old man. Oh wait, but he had three slightly younger sons. <laughs> By contrast, when Ken Ham tried to rebuild the Ark, he spent over a hundred million dollars, had over a thousand expert craftsmen, used modern machinery, cranes, and power tools, and he still needed to incorporate 95 tons of steel plates and bolts to ensure the stability and safety of the structure. And it still never left a concrete parking lot. Every one of these logs has to be cut by hand, and it takes about six guys two days to cut one log. So it's an incredible amount of work. When you're dealing with a large scale like this, the complexity of the connections of how the timbers connect into one another is mind boggling. The existence of the Ark Encounter alone is testament to the fact that this story is BS. I genuinely do not know how anyone in the 21st century can make it to adulthood and still believe that this literally happened. I had one skeptic write to me and say, do you really think that some 900 year old guy built this all by himself? And I said, no, the Bible says he was in his 500. Come on, just read the text. How do you not end up in a potato soup? Now I have lost all faith in humanity. And if you care to join me in my spiral, this is part two. Make sure that you check out Noah's Ark part one linked in the description below. Next up, I'll be debunking this stupid bullshit. So subscribe for that. And as always, dare to be curious, but don't drink the Kool-Aid.